Him. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. On uh, behalf of the IPCI, uh, we'd like to welcome one and all, and for most importantly, firstly, our guest, Professor Yusuf Dadu. Uh, I think to many here, he does not need introductions. For those who do not know him, uh, he's uh, the currently the head of Islamic Studies and Arabic at UNISA. Is a professor of Islamic studies and Arabic. He graduated at University of Durban Westville, and we are very uh, happy to see him. We were all colleagues. Many of us in this room here have been colleagues together at the university, and uh, brought back good memories to meet uh, old friends again at university. Uh, our ex Amir Ahmed said it was good enough to bring us together last night, and it was really a good uh, comeback after many years. Uh, I can tell you Professor Daru hasn't changed. He doesn't like these titles of professors and all that. <laughs> he keeps telling me. But I think sometimes formalities are needed. Uh, this evening's discussion, uh, we want to keep it as informal. That is why we removed the stand. Uh, one great feature of uh, Professor Yusuf is that I want to just mention one thing about him. So we set the pace for the evening. He says that uh, he, he personally, his yardstick, of uh, assessing people is that after having traveled maybe how far in life or how high in life in whichever dimension be it material educational but at the end of all that when you meet that person he's still the same person you knew that is the great person he those all those things didn't change him and make him to say I'm in another level now he's still the person who is approachable he's still the same person who you knew him to be because these things should not change your relationships with people and I think this is the it talks great I think uh, about a very Isl a great Islamic value because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know being the Nabi of Allah who can be greater than him but he related to everybody when he met a child he related to the child when he met a bishop and the Pope and the great ministers who came to debate with him he related to them at their level and this is I think the, the, the greatness of, of what the Prophet taught us so I think we, we want it to be a very informal evening this evening. And he, uh, Yusuf wants that, and we're going to grant him that. Uh, let's, let's be, you know, when you want to ask questions, just introduce yourself, give your name. And, you know, if you want to say where you're from, which organization, or what you're doing, is your prerogative, but at least introduce yourself. And let's have a good, inshallah, hope. And we have somebody who has been, uh, you can say, one of the founding members of the Muslim Youth Movement, the founding members of the MSA, uh, he's been actively involved in, in, in Islamic uh, education. Uh, he is now, he does, delivers papers internationally, locally. I mean, he's, we have somebody with a great resource in terms of uh, Islamic education in this country. Somebody who's been in, during the apartheid era and somebody who's in the transformation process now. And therefore, the evening, the one of the main focus of the evening is for him to guide us along for people who want to pursue studies further, you know, we want to study you know, in, in, in whatever field of Islamic studies we want to endanger in, at an academic level, at a uh, post-metric level. What, what are our options? You know, this is one of the things, inshallah, he will bring in. And maybe many of us I see who are sitting here are in certain arenas of education and what have you, and they may need want to, to know more. What can we do? And I must say, uh, Prof is very... Uh, uh, what's the word should I use? He's very open door policy. He's very open to uh, suggestions and to help. He's very willing to help wherever he can to use he, not only his services, but even uh, his position at UNISA if it's going to help uh, the uh, cause of education and the cause of the Ummah. So with these few words, I would uh, like to call upon Professor Yusuf Daru to give us his first input and then we'll have an open discussion. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد Dear brother Ahmed Sayyid Shall you please come forward? <laughs> you see, that is Yusuf the first piece. It's an instruction. <laughs> please. Please. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Okay. 
Jazakallah, Professor. You must know your place in society, brother. Okay. <laughs> um, while Brother Rafiq was introducing me, you know, I was so embarrassed. I, I almost couldn't recognize myself in all these things that were being mentioned about me. I wish I could reach that level that he has spoken of. I mean, may Allah always guide. May Allah make it easy for me and, of course, make it easy for all of us. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm not here to give you any formal lecture or anything of that sort. Uh, just to share some very important and valuable points that I think we need to discuss for the sake of the betterment of uh, the Muslim Ummah, first and foremost locally, before we can even think of any such thing abroad. Looking at the topic, well, as I understand it, this is not going to be a formal lecture, but I have to introduce these types of uh, ideas to you so that we can start getting some dialogue going. Education in this country at uh, university level, and especially as it relates to religion, in terms of my understanding, has changed a great deal from the time I was a student more than 30 years ago. We need not agree with everything, or we might not even necessarily disagree with everything. But the fact of the matter is that uh, with the coming of the new government, religion, in terms of our understanding, and especially when it comes to the teaching of Islam in relation to any other uh, religion is given, at least in theory, an equal footing to any other religion. In other words, gone are those days when they would say that a certain brand of Christianity, maybe Calvinistic theology, would be given preference and everything else would be put by the wayside. Those days are over. Now, you see, it's very nice for us to say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, and you know, raise our hands and our fists till they even uh, touch the sky and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, what do you do? You are given a challenge. Should we not be responding in an appropriate way? In other words, in terms of the government, I've heard this said by many, many of the top people, uh, starting from Mandela downwards. People who have said that, well, they look at the issue of religion very, very sympathetically, provided that it deals with the moral regeneration of people, and particularly if it has to do with social progress, social upliftment. And the ANC tells you clearly and unashamedly that, look, in our organization there are people of different religions who on the basis of their religious beliefs made their contributions, some of them even gave their lives. So to us all these religions are equal. We will respect them all because we respect the people who practice them, who have made their contribution to our organization. Now, we then become one in a basket of many. But you see, those days are gone when we were trampled upon by a Calvinist type of system, where Islam was declared a false heresy and everything else. Here we are given equal footing to everything else. 
But then remember also that this also needs to open up within us a broader, a more magnanimous, a kinder way in which we relate to others. Of course, we Muslims, it's very nice, mashallah, la ilaha We always say, no, democracy is very good, hallelujah. <laughs> but the point is, when it comes to practicing it in your own backyard, you have the same old hierarchical structures of this Buzruk society and that Buzruk crap and this and that. So the point is, we have not reformed. You see, we want everybody else to reform at upon, uh, you know, uh, in terms of our conditions. But when we look at ourselves, and that is something, as I told one religious leader, that my friend, democracy also brings its responsibilities. It also means that you are one among many. Don't you ever tell anybody that you are the sole repository of Islamic practice and piety and knowledge. That doesn't carry any weight anymore. Now, in line with that kind of thinking, at universities, and this is my experience at UNISA, um, we find that um, religions are valued so long as it brings people together. As soon as we are going to use religion to create division within different sectors of the South African society, we are not going to get any support, any help from the state. Of that you can be very sure. Now, that being the case, <coughs> At universities, the old type of comparative religion, uh, uh, comparative religion as was known in the 60s and the 70s, that has fallen by the wayside. What old comparative religion, I'm speaking about old comparative, what that actually meant is you compare different religions. Uh, finally, after doing all that, you said, okay, this one is the best, all those others are fake or whatever. You know, you passed your judgment. And sometimes it was a very harsh judgment that was passed. But let us look at it Islamically. Should we ever have been a part of that? Islam has never ever asked us to do that. I mean, where the Quran says in Surah Al-An'am that, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ that don't revile, don't insult those who worship, who call upon anybody else besides Allah and say, hey, you know, you worship that fellow, you worship that animal, or you worship this or that, right? In case they might do the same and insult and revile Allah, how would that be? Out of enmity, they say, all right, you say that about our God, this is what we say about yours. Without information, without knowledge, if they make those types of statements, how will, we will have to, uh, to, to answer for this before Allah, for that blasphemous statement that that person has uttered. So, we are not waiting for the new constitution. Allah explained this to us in the Quran long ago in case we did not know, that whenever we engage with people of other religions, we do so from a point of view of respect. And, I mean, there are so many other ayats of the Qur'an, I wouldn't even like to go into all those details, because that will take me away from what I would like to share with you, in terms of our university teaching of religion. Uh, this is the way it is going throughout the country. I don't think it's only particularly true of uh, UNISA. Um, of course, there might just be the odd exception in the case of uh, Rand Afrikaans University. I am not exactly certain 
how they do these things uh, they have a different structure in place but I wouldn't like to comment on how they approach things uh, I am quite certain that what I am saying holds true for my alma mater which is Durban Westville you mustn't forget you must never forget your roots you see uh, Durban Westville today under my dear friends colleagues with whom we worked with whom we toiled with whom we laughed with whom we cried I have not forgotten them and inshallah I shall bring them into the picture as well the same applies to some of my uh, friends uh, at the University of Western Cape in Cape Town of course I do not know the situation at the University of Cape Town because at the University of Cape Town those uh, academics uh, let me say uh, who had a very prominent profile are no longer there I really don't know when they'll return or what is happening so I, I cannot pass any judgment about them but let's say for UNISA for Durban Westville for University of the Western Cape I would imagine that what I'm saying is valid the point is uh, the way we probably also taught Islam in earlier times uh, sometimes you know social pressures do make us narrow-minded also or can sometimes broaden our vision and we must be prepared to accept that we could also have made our mistakes in earlier times but uh, there is no doubt that the current situation at least as far as this is concerned from purely from an Islamic perspective is much more dignifying that we we discuss religion openly freely but respectfully without hurting the fee feelings of others in a way that is exactly what feeds into what we call a more secular outlook of the present state anyway in other words, let the people discuss religion, let them practice religion, so long as it does not undermine the broader social, uh, the, the broader social fabric and stability of the country. Now, we then moved away from that old type of uh, comparative religion where it was more, uh, you know, you compared yourself with other religions for the sake of uh, finding those faults and then really reviling and insulting those people till you are blue in the face. That type of an approach is not permissible at any state tertiary institution. That's for certain. That we need to bear in mind. And in terms of our cooperation that we would like to have with, uh, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be discussing that, of course, with the IPCI. I'm not saying that there's anything like that from your side, but from our side, this, of course, we'll have to make very, very clear. The other thing that we need to bear in mind, as far as our teaching of religion is concerned, please, my brothers and sisters, I don't carry a card before me that I flash to prove that I'm a Muslim. I don't do it and I won't do it. Because my Islam is between me and Allah. And Allah will judge me. Just as He will judge you and just as He will judge any religious leader. So, then the point is, we need to understand very, very clearly that uh, at a university our offering of religion is not if you might call it uh, evangelical or missionary in approach it cannot be it cannot be not at a state institution number one so then what we do at a university or 
any is that we present what we understand to be the broad parameters of Islam, what Islam is all about, what different um, what we call these days the phenomenological approach. This is a bit of a jawbreak of a term, but uh, don't worry. If you can't pronounce it, if you don't understand it, it's okay. But you, you, you know what does it all basically boil down to? In other words, how do people who practice that religion themselves, how do they see that religion? That is what we mean by a phenomenological approach. In other words, not how others see you. But how you, or let's say, reasonable representations of the Muslim society, what do they see of their faith? For example, when you find Muslims speaking about, say, Hajj, what do they understand Hajj to be? What is the meaning of Hajj for them? How is it meant to change them? How is it meant to improve them? What are all these things that they do during Hajj? So you see, it's what the people who practice that faith, what they think about it. An insider's view rather than an outsider's view. That is what we call a phenomenological approach. But you see, within this we also need to understand no religion was ever, no religion was ever worth its salt was ever as monolithic and as straight jacketed as the Fur Trekker monument in Pretoria. <laughs> never, never, just understand it. It's only now that some of these uh, voices are coming to the fore that, well, I mean, you know, what those uh, Piavia Bhutta and all those people, they spoke, you know, that they spoke for Calvinistic uh, brand of Christianity. They did not speak for the entire Christianity. But then the same applies to us. We must not foist any particular point of view down the throats of anybody, uh, at least at university level. Oh sure, I have my own opinions about many, many things. but. Exactly what that means, well, that, that's a matter of private, separate discussion. But at university, I cannot, for example, turn around and say that all the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia are devils, or all of them are saints, or that all the people who stand up and perform salami are going first into Jannat before anybody else in the Muslim Ummah or something of that sort, etc., etc. I'm just giving you some examples. No, no. What we have to do very honestly is to say that in the light of the understanding there are pockets within Muslim society who feel this, who feel that, who feel that, who feel that. There are differences of opinion about these things regardless of what our own ideas and our own attitudes might be. This is what we call an academic approach to religion. Any university worth its salt whenever it teaches religion, it adopts an, what we call uh, an academic approach to the teaching of religion and not what is termed in Christianity as a cataclysmic approach. Cataclysm, meaning, you know, it's just like uh, going to the religious schools. Sorry, you know, I, I do rub quite a bit of shoulder with uh, Christians, so I'm using some of their words. But I mean, uh, that doesn't mean, huh, I must take out my card to show you that I'm still a Muslim. Okay? The, 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 the point is, what a cataclysm is, it's like this type of indoctrinated system that you even get in madrasas. Alright? There is a place for that, no doubt there is a place for that. But the university is not the place for that. I cannot open up, say, for example, any literature like the six points and say, bro, fire up. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> if I did that, I'm gone. I can say, yes, there is a movement that looks at things this way. There is another one that looks that way. You show different points of view. Now, this, of course, looks very healthy to what I call a normal 
level-headed type of person, he might think that, oh, but you know, you're confusing, man. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, any ummah, there is enough confusion, make no mistake. We, we mustn't hide, we must not hide. People who claim that everything is above board and everything is kosher, either they don't know or they are lying. And we must be honest enough as Muslims to realize that there are some serious differences of opinion among us as well. If we cannot really analyze them and solve them, at least at an academic level, we should be able to present them. And that is exactly what we have to do when we present our duty, uh, our offerings relating to religion. Now, um, that will always have to be borne in mind whenever any of you wish to engage with any university to partner you in anything relating to, let's say, uh, the teaching of religion. Th uh, that's an unavoidable issue. But you know, there is something else that uh, I would like to take up with you. I thought, and uh, unless if I'm proven to the contrary, I would like to, excuse me, believe that even in some of these uh, village uh, religious uh, seminaries in India, there is the move now, in some of them, towards giving some or other additional skills, you know, empowerment, giving of skills together with what they learn uh, in uh, the, these uh, seminaries or institutions, so that a person, you don't expect every person who is a graduate of a Darul Ulum, you know, a religious seminary, to be an Imam, that is not going to happen whether you like it or not. In fact, many of the guys I see around me, they're only selling cell phones. <laughs> oh. And flea marketeers, or, you know, uh, in the business of their forefathers, whatever, I mean, they're following nobly in the footsteps of their forefathers, which is not bad. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is, then don't say, don't ever claim that you are doing enough for the religion. Yes. Imam Abu Hanifa was also a trader, an ace trader, the most affluent trader in Baghdad. But he made enough time for his students. If any bourgeois religious leader fails to do that, he is not even a proper Hanafi. Okay, that's another matter altogether. But the fact of the matter is that we must have some skills together with what we acquire in terms of, let's, for want of more ifs and buts, let's just call it broad Islamic knowledge. So the thing then is, we must welcome and we must encourage those of our people involved in Dawa not just to trade in the currency of the hereafter they must also be able to do something for the here and now either to fix a leaking tap fix up some sort of a short circuit whatever they must not be stretching out their hands to people. It's among the most degrading things, you know, when people stretch out their hands before Allah's creation rather than before Allah the Creator. And uh, an important point that we need to bear in mind when we are training our da'is, those people who would be inviting people to the way of Allah, Let's give them some or other type of skill. And the benefit of that, in terms of my understanding, at least in terms of, let's say, the IPCI, I just discussed this very casually this afternoon, Brother Rafiq, so I'm not saying anything new. Of course, uh, 
there are a few requirements that need to be fulfilled, but the fact of the matter is, if you do anything in terms of skills improvement, you can even expect some or other form of subsidy and financial assistance from the state. And that, of course, you are entitled to. You are doing the right thing, which even Islam would be encouraging you to do. You are not robbing the state of even a cent. You are giving them more than their pound of flesh, if you were to be doing that. So, when we are training our da'is, remember this is an important consideration, and those who would like to register at UNISA, in time to come, inshallah ta'ala, we will be discussing that later at some time. But the point is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel in some or other ways. I know some of our religious leaders, they finished at the Darul Ulum, suddenly it became fashionable for them and they were getting some of these uh, degrees closer to my area very easily. They said, what are you doing? I'm studying Islam. I said, what did you do there in the Darul Ulum? Were you running a barber shop? <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, but now, why are you repeating? I mean, what is needed is that some of you, for example, I said in relation to, I said some of you should be doing law, different aspects of law, somebody in mercantile law, somebody else in tax, some, if not tax evasion, uh, <laughs> you, you know, all, all this is so that, so that you, ca you can advise people. If it, comes to, uh, if it comes to other issues, whether it's constitutional law, criminal law, whatever, all right? Uh, or, for that matter, even IT. These are fields, vast fields. That is what we want, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you register for any sort of study at a university, think about that. We, of course, will, be, will gladly welcome you. But at the same time, as a brother, not as a professor, not as an academic, as your brother in Islam, I urge you to think that please think of some or other uh, avenue as well in which you can, uh, you know, you can strengthen your own position and use it together with Islam, with your broader Islamic knowledge to be of service to people. Otherwise, it is no better than what we might call the old BA degree. It's a dead-end street. Nothing else. I mean, I should know that myself. But the point is, if you are going to take it in association with, say, something in law, something in commerce, whatever, something in IT, that is what we need. In other words, we have different da'is for, you know, uh, for, 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 for different needs. They become sort of small-time uh, specialists in their own ways. It's not a case of one size fits all. It never works that way. Never. Uh, that <coughs> is, of course, my... Uh, the, the, the hand of cooperation that I, on behalf of my employer, the University of South Africa, the new UNISA, would like to extend to you, uh, we will be more than happy. We will be honored and dignified. I mean, after all, the IPCI, all said and done, uh, has left its mark and still does leave its mark in many sectors of our society, both locally as well as abroad. So, we will be more than happy to enter into any sort of agreement where we can cooperate to the best of our ability, so that both we benefit as well as you benefiting. There is something else that I would like to say and then uh, conclude my discussion, Brother Rafiq. Um, you see, a university, gone are those days when a university 
uh, the staff was comprised of people who looked so intelligent. I don't know if such people ever did exist. But they look, I mean, sometimes appearance and reality is, uh, oh, you know, the story carries on. But, you know, they, they, they had to put up the show and they had to withdraw from society, live in their ivory towers. And, I mean, Sheikh Saadi, rahmatullahi you know, this very great Sufi, you know, this one story of his. I mean, uh, I, I would like to share this with you before I continue. Uh, he said that, you know, there was one... Sufi somewhere in Egypt, the person at a certain stage decided not to speak. So he became a kind of a mystique. People from all around, near and far, came and they said, Oh, look at this man, the man. Allah has given him a mouth, but he doesn't open it. What's happening? <laughs> Some, you know, now all sorts of theories are, start being presented. Some say, you know what, he's not talking because he's only talking to Allah. Now, you know, he's not talking to us human beings, us mortals. I mean, uh, you, you know, we're not in his league, right? He became so popular that even in the neighboring countries, his, na his name and fame spread. Until about 30 years later, he decided to open his mouth <laughs> and when he did open his mouth he spoke utter trash so the moral of the story then for Sheikh Saadi is it is better that you remain silent than to speak nonsense. You, in that way, you at least earn the respect and the dignity <laughs> of people. <laughs> and he, of course, said it very beautifully in Farsi that beyond desh va'ange bar avarad nafas, think before you utter any expression, before you expel any air from your mouth. Wa'az an pesh bas kun ki goyan de bas. And before people tell you bas, that means before people tell you, okay, stop, you make a stop yourself. And he says, Banutk admi as dabab. By means of the ability to speak, a human being is better than animals. Dabab as tu garnagoi sawab. But those animals are better than you if you don't speak that which is right and that which is true. So, you know. The point is, there was this aura, this mystique created that people, uh, some people, uh, professional academics, felt that they should withdraw from society. <laughs> and in that way, oh yes, they became immensely powerful. It was remote control, you see, quietly, <laughs> uh, things were happening. But today, universities don't work that way. Please, do you still think they work that way? If you think they are, please, your knowledge is outdated, come to me, I'll talk to you more. <laughs> All right. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. At every university, we are taught that our responsibilities are three. One is teaching. One is teaching. The other is research. Research means we investigate certain things that we consider to be of importance to us and the society in the hope of finding some some new light shedding new light on a certain topic that's what research is all about and thirdly community service and that is what I'm trying to do by speaking to you um, so the point then is those days are gone when you found these arrogant fellows you know always wearing suits and things and hiding away that was very often male parda uh, yeah sitting in those ivory towers today I mean th th those types of academics are outdated uh, but now you see our requirement number two is requirement of research as I said and it is for that my brothers and sisters understand that 
we are of course a state asset, a, any university is a state asset, but remember that through the state we are also an asset of the community that it is supposed to serve. We would like to be your asset, we would like to be your university. I'm not trying to push for my university in particular, I would like to see the same type of uh, relationship you have with our own. Well, of course, the name has changed, huh? Yeah, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sorry, man, you know, I mean, they're, they're, these, these acronyms get me a little <laughs> thing, but okay. University of Wazulu Natal, okay. All right, so don't speak of UDW anymore, all right, okay. Just as you must speak of the new UNISA. All right. The, 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 the point then is that uh, this is the way, uh, you, you know, this university in your vicinity has also served the needs of our people. Never ignore it. Of course, UNISA has had a different role altogether to play because of distance education. Its students are scattered throughout the world. We have students from any part of the world, really. Okay? And not just one or two, but uh, uh, if you consider across the board, whether it's degrees, diplomas, certificates, this and that, you are looking at at least 200,000 students. Okay? Per annum. Not for a lifetime, per annum. Right. Uh, that being the case, what happens is, we need to be closer to the community that we serve also. That's our responsibility and our duty. We also have a research center at our university, which for various reasons, I don't want to go into all those details now, is really dysfunctional. And my appeal to you is, of course, I don't expect an immediate answer. Give this some thought. You want us to serve you, help us to strengthen ourselves, strengthen our structures within UNISA, because through that our Muslim Ummah <coughs> will benefit. This particular center, no doubt, needs some sort of a capital injection. And uh, I'm just leaving with you some basic, broad ideas about what we can do. Uh, it, uh, call the Center for Arabic and Islamic Studies. There are two projects that I personally think very dear to my heart. If I do not do anything else for the rest of my time, as an employee of UNISA, if I can just manage to do something in terms of these two, Alhamdulillah, I will be so grateful to Allah. One is, you know, it's to our eternal shame that we are, we, we are very good as pamphleteers and all that kind of thing, but none of us, you know, the Muslims in this country haven't written anything like a comprehensive account of Islam and Muslims in this country right from the time of the emergence of the first Muslims to the present day. Yes, little booklets and manuals we have plenty of varying academic quality, by the way, not all of them of equal standard, but even that very limited. Isn't it a shame that 350 years have passed and we don't even have a proper work refer uh, relating to Islam and Muslims in this country. This, of course, does not require the effort of one person. Imam Ghazali and people like him are gone. For such people you only make dua. You don't find such people. And any person who ever tells you that there's such people around, I tell you the person is a bogus. Okay. So the point then is, we would need teams of researchers looking at different aspects of Islam. Whether it is legal, whether it is commercial, whether it is educational, political, family life, individual life, uh, yes, uh, the lives of children, sport, this, that, etc., etc. How have Muslims lived? What have they done? What haven't they done? Why have they done what they've done? 
you know, a good insight into Muslim society, both for us, our posterity, and for broader South African and world society. Something of quality we need to produce. Another thing, well, in terms of my teaching, again, at distance education, um, it's a pity that there is nothing that I can seem to find that is of really good quality, comprehensive work, multimedia on the teaching of standard Arabic, multimedia course. I know this would take a great deal of effort and it would we would need to bring in people from different fields. Uh, for that we need something like a center where we have teams of researchers, where, where we have teams of people involved, people you can contract to do certain bits of work and so on. And that remains your asset. You are entitled to come and examine for yourselves what this institute, what the center is doing. In other words, don't just give a, uh, you, you know, uh, just don't just give any old blind check. You take responsibility. You come and check up on us. You're welcome to do so. But money does talk, so long as we are living in this world. And these are the types of brief ideas that I felt I needed to share with you. Uh, I hope I haven't over... Uh, burdened you with what I've had to say. I will be very happy for any advice, any guidance that you can give me. Jazakumullah. Sure. All right, shukran, uh, Professor Dadu, for that. By the way, uh, just for the sake of completeness, I think many of us have known of the our st stalwart in the struggle, other Dr. Dadu is uh, related to our professor Dalu, yeah, he's from the same stock as well. And uh, the talk that he gave this evening, I think his, uh, a lot of things was very thought-provoking. I think the, he's tried to show how religion is being viewed uh, currently. Uh, and if anybody wants to go to university level, uh, myself, Molana, uh, at the moment at KwaZulu Natal University, I know uh, in the Department of Religion and Culture and exactly what Professor is saying is the approach is the same there, which gives us an equal footing with other religions. And I think this idea of the, the this research center Professor is talking about, you know, well, as IPCI, I always speak to our trustees and we, we, are, we cannot, if somebody has to ask us, Prof, if they have to ask us, uh, how many people embrace Islam every month in this country? We can't tell them. We can only tell them about IPCI. But we haven't got a simple st network, a center like yours, if a research center, if we have one. I'm just trying to give us ideas. Everyone could link to that center and say, demographically, from the nine provinces, these are the number of people who became Muslim, so many from uh, this demographic background, whatever, whatever. I'm just trying to say, we can have a, a statistic to give. Right now, we have so many Dawa bodies, but we can't give a proper statistic. We ourselves don't know at what rate things are happening in this country, just in the field of reversion, people embracing Islam. I'm just giving one aspect of the importance, and Prof is trying to say at UNISA he has got, there is a structure there, but it has just gone defunct. Uh, we, will t we will take this up, inshallah, at the trusteeship level, but because there